take time to be holy. Speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always. And feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing. His blessing to see. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy. Let him be thy guide. And run not before him. Whatever be time, in joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each temper beneath his control. Thus, led by his spirit, the fountains of love, thou shalt. Soon be fitted for service aboard. Many are saying, I am grateful to this person. I am thankful to this person. Thank God for him. Thank God. When this person came my way, life became better. What this person said to me blessed my life. Thank God for that. So, you can now see that righteousness is a blessing to you. It is a blessing to others. God, of course, they wants you to live a righteous life. It will bless your life. It will bless others. But, I want you to know that is not the end of righteousness. That is not the whole thing about righteousness. Nothing on earth can serve a sufficient reward of righteousness. Nothing on earth can serve a sufficient joy of righteousness. Nothing on earth can serve satisfactorily as compensating you for righteousness. Of course, that is not the mind of God. The righteousness God has brought to this world is a life that has a blessing somewhere. The ultimate end of righteousness, actually, the full blessings of righteousness is not in this earth. It's not. God did not come to serve you so that you can live a good life. That's not. It's more than that. God did not serve you so that you can bless your fellow man. It's, no, it's more than that. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I read verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. Apostle Paul said, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If the blessings of righteousness were only to be in this life, I'm telling you, people we interceded for them shortly would even have been better human beings than us. Because the righteous feels caught in his heart when he sees the prosperity of the wicked. When he sees that they, they are far from evil, that they eat and drink and that, that their skin shines. The righteous wonders. He said, I wonder, in fact, when I consider the prosperity of the wicked, I said, then I have washed my hands in vain. I have washed my hands in vain. Look at it in Psalm 73. I read from verse 1. Psalm 73. Truly, God is good to Israel. Even to such are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well near slipped. 
For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bonds in their dead, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as Adam in. Neither are they plagued like Adam in. Therefore, pride compassed them about as a chain. Violence covered them as a garment. Their eyes turn out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily they, I have cleansed my heart in vain. And washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. They understood I their aim. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. This is the voice of the righteous man. That is saying, I have been righteous. I cleanse myself. I cleanse my heart. But what is the reward actually? I'm seeing the sinners prospering. I, they're very proud. They're very rude. They're very wicked. They even tell God we have no need of you. God doesn't see us. Do we have any concern about God? And yet they're doing well. They're living well. They're not the ones ruling. They're not the ones winning. They're not the ones people are saluting. Then I say, why? Why have I been righteous all this while? That's why Paul said, if it were for this life only, if it were for the blessings of this life only, if it were just for the peace of this life only, that we are righteous. I'm telling you, it is it, then righteousness is not it, it, it's not valuable as much. It's not valuable as much. God has not made you righteous for this world. The God of heaven that has brought salvation upon your life is not saying that you should have it to live in this world. No, it is because he will reward you in the world to come. In the book of John chapter 14, I read verse 1 to verse 4. John chapter 14, verse 1 to verse 4 let not your heart be troubled ye believe in God believe also in me in my father's house that is the promise of the righteous that is where the reward of the righteous is in my father's house that is the aim of righteousness that is why Jesus brought righteousness to the world that is why you were given the garment of righteousness in my father's house that is the ultimate reward of righteousness in my father's house are many mansions I'm talking about that is where righteousness counts that is where the difference is between the righteous and the sinner. That is where the difference is. That is where righteousness lasts forever. In my father's house are many mansions. That is what the Lord has set before you as the purpose of righteousness, as the end of righteousness, as the reward of righteousness. In my father's house, there are many mansions. There are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you to prepare. That's the reward of righteousness. A prepare to prepare to get a place ready to get a space for your life to get an accommodation for your life to get a place for you in eternity that is the reward of righteousness if it is for this life only 
you suffer what you suffer in the hands of your husband if it is for this life only you receive the rejection that you have received in the hands of the world it is for this life only that you suffer the persecutions of life from the hands of the ungodly you have all been most miserable but the Lord is saying it is in my father's house righteousness is going to be in my father's house the reward of righteousness the reward of righteousness shall be in heaven I say it shall be in heaven I go to prepare a place for you when I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that is the, the reward the end of righteousness the, the journey ends there that is where the brightness of righteousness actually begins to shine to eternity I will receive you unto my soul that where I am there ye may be also and he said whither I go ye know and the way you know I'm talking about a place that you know I'm talking about heaven I'm talking about heaven your heart may be troubled on earth but heaven 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 I'm preparing it for you again you look at in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 Ephesians I'm talking about the end of righteousness in case you do not know the end of righteousness that means where righteousness is taking you to what righteousness shall bring upon you what righteousness shall accomplish over you in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 I read verse 4 to verse 7 the Bible tells us here saying but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins had quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved and had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come I'm telling you that's where the reward of righteousness can be seen that's the can you see the purpose of God here why he saved you from sin why he gave that grace to you that in the ages to come you have not got it yet listen a white a white man a European came to Africa for missionary work he labored in Africa for about 40 good years part of the hazards of the work his wife caught sickness and died and this man this man was going back to America after 40 years as an old man because he was weak he was going back to his nation now as he, he entered the same ship that a general an army general that came from america to africa for two weeks was in that ship so they were going together to america so when they arrived he saw crowds of people at the show with cheerful faces happy welcome he blessed his own heart he said oh my home church have seen my labor they are happy with me for how I yielded my life for the work of God until I suffered various hazards my wife died see they are coming to cheer me so he comforted his heart now when they arrived he did not know that the crowd of people at the show were there to welcome the army general that came to Africa for two weeks and was returning so when every, the general went first and then he came out and saw that everybody disappeared not one person was waiting for him not one he came to he came he highlighted and say wonderful that's it where am i going from here whose house i've not been here for 40 years now 
Whose house am I going now? <sighs> he remembered a friend. The telephone of a friend. So he rang the friend. And said, I have come. Then the friend and his wife came over quickly to welcome him. You are welcome. You are welcome. You can go to our house. They took him to their house. And would show him a room where he could stay. This man went in there and fell down before the Lord. Say, Lord, I went to Africa, risked my life for your name, for the salvation of the people in, Af in Africa, for 40 years, and you know the hazards of my life. I returned, not a single person was there to welcome my coming home. A an army general, a sinner, that went just for two days, two weeks, crowds of people waited for him. How could life be like that with me? What have I done that I could be treated so? Did you, did you value my labor? Did you value my sacrifice? Did you feel my pain? The Lord said, my son, you have not yet come home. When you come home, you will see. You will see the welcome that is waiting for you. My son, you have not yet come home. That's the voice of God. I am telling you, the Bible says that in the ages to come, that is where righteousness comes. That is where the, Jesus said something. He said, on, I mean, concerning John the Baptist, he said there has been no has been risen no man born of a woman like John the Baptist. Yet he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now he's talking something. The least, the least in privileges, the least in privileges is greater than John the Baptist. He's talking about privileges even of this life. Because of privileges of eternity, John has it equally. But then what are we saying? The least is greater than the greatest. The least righteous, least righteous, righteous child, righteous daughter of God, you are greater than the presidents of this life. You are greater than the greatest men of this life. But you will not see it until you go there. Until you come home. Because that is why he placed the reward of righteousness. Listen to what he said. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The aim of God is that after we have passed through this life, we have passed through the training of this life, we have passed through the hazards of life. We have passed through every, the buffeting of this life. Day he will take us to heaven and open up treasures of God. Treasures. Pledges. Eternal wealth of God. The reason why he made you righteous for himself is coming up when you enter heaven. So, now, number one, Bible sins lift for heaven. Bible sins lift for heaven. The Old Testament sins, that's what I mean. They lift for heaven. Because that's actually the home. That is the place of heavenly reward. Yes, living for heaven. What does it mean that they lift for heaven? They lift in the righteousness of life in the sight of God because that is what will take them to heaven yes they sought divine approval in the daily living because that would take them to heaven yes they walked with God and qualified for entry into heaven Yes, they lived a rapturable life. Every day 
you made sure they were fit at any moment to enter heaven so the vision of heaven was was a was the purpose of their living they had it before them and of course they knew that it was the ultimate reward of their righteous and faithful life the purpose living for heaven was the the ultimate reward of their righteous and faithful life and that regulated their actions it made them to be critical judges of themselves it made them to be a guide and counselor to himself on this heavenly race it kept them examining themselves all the time all the time checking up on themselves yes the saints of all living for heaven it made them to keep their garment from being defiled it made them to keep their garment from being defiled living in this way was what took Enoch from to heaven living in this way look at it in the book of Genesis chapter 5 verse 22 to 24 Genesis chapter 5 verse 22 to 24 the Bible says and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him can you see heaven was in their goal heaven was in their heart they live for it every day examining themselves watching over themselves until you see God took Enoch alive God took Enoch alive the patriarchs lived by faith of heaven until their date every time they set heaven before them look at it in the book of hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 to 16 hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 to 16 the bible tells us here saying these all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth they saw this earth as a strange place they saw this earth as a pilgrimage land they saw themselves as strangers in the earth they saw themselves as pilgrims people go to Jerusalem as pilgrims and they knew Jerusalem was not their is not their home and so that they're coming back to their country so these patriarchs the fathers of old they lived in this world and saw the world as a strange place not a home they saw this world not a home so they saw themselves as pilgrims on the earth verse 14 for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country they fix a place before them they fix a place before them that place is called heaven that place everybody it is called heaven that's the place will you find some of these ones that went by divine revelation they say i met with abraham i i i saw isaac i saw i saw moses i saw that these people fixed heaven they lived for heaven their thoughts were on heaven their thoughts and plans everything about them what regulated them in this world was heaven 
They were seeking heaven. They were thinking for heaven. They were praying about heaven. It was their first goal. It was the place of their dream. It was the place of their battle. It was the place of their struggle. The place of their investment. All of their concern was heaven. And they found themselves there. Look at it in verse 15. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from winds, they came out. They might have had an opportunity to have returned. If they were thinking of their villages, maybe they would have have opportunity to go back to their villages. Their thoughts were not on their villages. No, heaven. But now they desire a better country. That is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. He had prepared a prepared place. Heaven is a prepared place. When Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you, not only for you, for the Old Testament sons, God has prepared a city. A city prepared for them and heavenly. Not the best city of this, of this world. No, not the best city of this world. I'm talking about a city that the people counted all the nations of this world as a strange place. I said, what is this? They counted all the towns, all the cities of the, the whole world and its pleasure and its decoration. He, they counted it as a strange thing. Why? Because of the heavenly city. God has prepared for them a place. He has prepared for them a place. Heavenly place. Wonderful place. That's what God has prepared for them. And for that, they, they fought everything. Joseph, when Potiphar's wife said, I am cheaply available for you. I'm cheaply available. You can have me cheap. Your, my husband will not know about it. You can have your pleasure. Joseph said, me? Can I do this wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph set heaven before him. Nothing must make Joseph to miss heaven. Nothing must carry away heaven from Joseph. The woman caught his cloth. Joseph removed it for her. Nothing. No woman, no money, no position, no anything in this life is qualified to remove heaven. They said heaven. That's why they say we are strangers in this life. If some of them came and saw you and saw the way you are behaving and saw the way you handle this life, they will wonder at you. They will know that you are not among them. They will know that you are not a stranger. The things you are doing that doesn't show you are a stranger in this earth. It doesn't show you have a better country. A superior country. A delightful place. Superior to this place. The way you live your life doesn't show you are thinking of this place. It doesn't show. Now, what about Moses? In the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 36 to 38. Hebrews 11, 36. Now, you will see how Moses himself, how, how Moses treated the matter of heaven. Please, let's read verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to verse 26. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He was thinking of heaven. He had the privilege to have been a pharaoh because as it was because as it was said then pharaoh had only a daughter and the daughter had given birth 
had gotten a child, adopted a child, and she had not married. And that child was called after Pharaoh. And Moses was given the best training, education of Egypt. He could have been the next Pharaoh. He would have taken over the throne. But the Bible says, by faith of heaven. By faith of the promise of his fathers. By faith of what God has set before men. Moses got the glimpse of heaven and he rejected the provision. He rejected the privilege of being a pharaoh. He rejected it. But your people over there are suffering, Moses. Your people over there are in shame. The Egyptians laugh at them. The Egyptians scorn at them. They treat them as fools. He said, I will want to identify with those fools. Because the great reward that is following that foolishness is the best reward that the eternal God has preserved. I will belong to this foolish company. So he rejected those things and suffered the reproaches of Christ. Moses had to run away to be in Midian for 40 years. Yes, let me be in Midian for 40 years and let me go to this heaven. Let me suffer exile, but let me go to this heaven. He was now made a, a prince in Egypt, was now made to be rearing cattle. Let me get the lowest employment. Let me get this heaven. I'm telling you, heaven set before them. I'm talking about people that have lived before you. Heaven occupied them. Heaven filled them. Now, see the other ones. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 27. Hebrews 11, 24 to 27. The Bible is telling us, please, sorry, verse 36 to 38. Verse 36 to 38. And others have trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yeah. Moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sown asunder. They were tempted. Were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Can you understand that? They say, do everything on me. I cannot turn from heaven for this world. I cannot. They were killed. They carried some of them by cutting their hands, cutting away their feet. Do it, finish, because I will soon be entering heaven. Do it, finish, because I will soon be entering there. In the communist land, in the day persecution, I was, a story was told of a man, a saint that was caught because he was preaching Jesus. And then they got him. They got no, I think it is in the early time. They got it. They got him to burn him alive. So when they imprisoned him to give him some days to turn away from Jesus, they would come and say, Turn away from Jesus. They would come, can you turn away? I say, Can you turn away? Everybody say no. Everybody say no. Hey, the wife of this man became apprehensive. He said, oh, I hope my husband is not going to subject himself to these temptations and then turn away. I hope my husband will not backslide. Hey, I will want to get my husband in the prison and tell him to stand his ground and die in the faith. Then she went to meet the authority. He said, I want to see my husband. I have a word for my husband. Then they say, what type of word? I have a word for my husband. Then they said, but make sure. Is it to go and encourage him to turn away from Jesus? See the precious thing in this life. See the privileges your husband is missing. See, look at you. He wants to make you a widow. How could that be? Now, tell us. But you must promise us you're not going to say anything contrary to your husband. She said, I am not going to say anything contrary for the good of my husband. They, when they saw it, they said, this woman is going to change that man. So, quickly, 
they allowed the, the woman to go and see her husband in the prison. And they went to supervise it because they went, they went along with her to know what she was going to tell the husband. When the woman went and saw the husband say, Darling, don't turn away from Jesus. In a short time, you will see him. In a short time, you'll be entering paradise. In a short time, you'll be wearing the crown. Don't turn away from Jesus. Stand your ground. I am ready to lose you on earth. We shall join up in heaven. Then the, the people say, eh? Is that what you're saying? You are in trouble. Is that what we thought you were coming to tell this one to turn away from Jesus? He said, turn away from my Lord. I can never say anything like that. I, I can't. They say, okay. You mean you stand for Jesus? I stand for him ten times. Then they say, okay, even you will die. Oh, what a precious news I'm hearing today. You mean I will still see Jesus? You mean I shall see into heaven? Hey, glory, 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 hallelujah. Is this woman mad? <laughs> They took her and locked her up to see whether in three days or a, after a time she will come back to her senses. After a time they said, okay, now what do you say? Are you still ever more for Jesus? Ever more for Jesus? What an excitement. What a bubbly going on in me that I shall soon see my Lord. One glorious morning I shall see my Savior. And that morning is already coming. They say, okay, if you, then, if you don't give up in three days, we shall hang, we shall burn you up with your husband. Eh, 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 eh. You mean I am my husband? This marriage is a blessed one. You mean I shall enter heaven with my husband at the same time? Praise the Lord! <laughs> That is how they carried both him, both her and her husband to go and burn them up. As they were going, she was busy telling her husband, no trouble, we shall soon see Jesus. We shall soon see our Lord. We shall soon enter heaven. They were going. You know, I don't know what happened. Maybe the man was shaking a little. The man was shaking a little. You know, it's good to have a good wife that will be encouraging you in the time you want to lose your faith. She said, no, you cannot lose your faith. You must stand for Jesus. That was the type of wife Martin Luther had. When Martin Luther stood for the gospel of Christ and said the just shall live by faith and the Catholic authority said recant, retreat, draw back. The persecution became so heavy that Martin Luther ran away and entered into a cave and hid himself there and was no more preaching and was more concerned for his life. The wife of Martin Luther dressed herself in a black cloth in a garment of dead or that somebody as if somebody had died and she located her husband to the cave in this morning state and Queen the Martin Luther looked at her and said come up oh, what has happened my wife what has happened has somebody died he said yes somebody died somebody preciously died a glorious person died Martin Luther became afraid who could have died around them he said who died he said God has died God has died Martin Luther said God is not dead he said if God is not dead what are you doing in this cave if God is not dead get out and preach God for he is the living God he is the living God he is the glorious God Martin Luther jumped out of the cave and said herein I stand they just shall live by faith they just shall live by faith hallelujah yes I'm talking to, to you about commitment to heaven that is how that man and the wife they entered into the fire and burned gloriously with songs in their lips until they went to heaven when you go there, now you have had the story. When you go there, you will look for her. <laughs> Hallelujah! You are going to look for them. 
You are going to see. People shall have their testimonies. That's why I pity those who don't want to suffer. People shall be telling testimonies. When Jesus rose from the grave, he showed the testimony of his suffering in this life. He showed the testimony of his torments in this life for the sake of your life. And because he must obey God and you are running away from suffering, what are you going to tell in heaven? What are you going to tell? God in mercy granted you little privilege to suffer. And you are running away. You cry. You curse. You say no. Then what shall you tell? When you enter there. When people shall be telling great testimonies. Of what they did for Jesus. How they gave up themselves for Jesus. Their labor for souls of men. What shall you say? Point number two. The believers in the New Testament lived for heaven. Everybody say, live for heaven. Live for heaven. Say it again. Live for heaven. heaven occupied the hearts of the believers in the New Testament era. It informed how they lived. Their evangelism and Christian ministry. Their response to threats persecutions and wants it influenced their relationship with God their relationship with their fellow believers and their relationship with the world around them they often exhorted and comforted one another with the hope of heaven yes Stephen withstood Compromise and the fear of men and was rewarded with heaven at his own date because that was what occupied their hearts. It was their interest, it was their prayer, it was their hope. Look at it in the book of Acts of Apostles, chapter 7, verse 54 to 60. Acts of Apostles, chapter 4. Verse 67, chapter 7 rather, verse 64, then verse 54 to 60. When they had these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed upon him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And they said, Behold. And, and said, Behold. I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice. And stopped their ears. And ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes on a young man's feet whose name was Saul he shall soon be contaminated with heaven he too shall soon be filled up with heaven and they stoned Stephen heal, calling upon God and saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit and he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin in their church. And when he had so said, he fell asleep. I'm telling you, brother, Jesus is waiting for you. Amen. Sister, Jesus is waiting for you. Amen. When they were stoning Stephen, I mean, when the persecution surrounded Stephen, he said, his eyes opened. Jesus wanted Stephen to stand firm. Stephen, heaven is greater than what you shall face. Stephen, heaven is greater than what you are facing now. Stand that challenge. Don't deny me. And he gave him the privilege. As he's given many of us the privilege to look into heaven. He opened heaven and Stephen looked into heaven and saw 
the glory of heaven the beauty of heaven the throne of heaven the presence of the Godhead he saw Jesus standing at the right hand side of the father and saying Stephen we are ready for you to come and join us for eternal eternal life eternal living whatever you are suffering we will welcome you my father is ready for you I am ready I am even standing up I am honoring you that a saint is entering heaven I stand up with all my love with all my appreciation that you suffer what you are suffering for me I stand up to welcome you to heaven they stone Philip yes Stephen they stone him because it was his day of dying it was how the Lord planned that he should die because there is also a crown of martyrdom there is the reward of dying for Jesus I remember somebody that went to heaven and he said there was a time of cele- there are so many celebrations one of this time Paul the apostle was passing him and was going joyfully going very joyfully because Jesus was going to meet with a, a special type of people then he asked Paul where are you going he said Jesus is going to meet with a special type of people which type of people he said those that were martyred for him only those that died for him those that suffered and died for him they were killed not those who died natural death no they are also there but everybody has his own time he said others are coming to be spectators but those Jesus will display before the angels before the saints in heaven are those that were martyred for him if the Lord grants you that privilege it's because he's going to show you before the angels he's going to display you before your sins it in the eternity from eternity to eternity there shall be a day of remembrance that the people that died for him and that you are one of them that your name shall come forth your name shall come forth that you died for Jesus that's why if the time to die comes don't deny him the reward is great don't run away when they wanted to crucify Peter as history said he was running away and when he was running away Jesus was going to the place of the crucifixion he said my lord where are you going I am going to the place of crucifixion that they can crucify me the second time why since you have refused to die for me I died for you a time came I present provided the glorious time I provided that glorious time because of my special love for you because of the eternal celebration that I have and I chose that you should be among those I will glorify from eternity to eternity because you died for me but you are running away I am going back there Peter said Lord I'm going back I'm going for the crucifixion they should crucify me now then Peter went and said don't crucify me upward crucify me upside down why must I be crucified like my Lord and that is how he died and his name entered into the register of Matthias heaven you will still hear more you are still going to hear more about heaven it's a precious thing it's a marvelous thing yes very great apostle paul consecrated himself walked and suffered much for this heaven (laughs) you don't know why paul suffered what he suffered you don't know why he stood all the persecutions they stoned him and he there was no life in him he rose up and continued he said as long as in me is i am for christ woe is me if i preach not this gospel none of these things moved me why did he come to that point is because of what he saw look at it in second corinthians chapter 12 i read 
2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1 to verse 4 the Bible tells us there saying it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell God know it such an one caught up to the third heaven and I knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell God know it how he was caught up into paradise and had unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to speak I had unspeakable words that I did not have the power to utter them concerning the rewards of righteousness concerning the rewards of serving the Lord I went to see things that I don't have the power to utter them why wow, they're so great and when he saw heaven he saw the glory of heaven he saw the majesty of heaven he saw the crown of heaven he saw the mansions of heaven come and see the suffering of that man come and see the works of that man look at what he did in the book of first corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 first corinthians chapter 15 i read verse 10 he said but by the grace of god i am what i am and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain but i labored more abundantly than they all I knew what I saw. I saw heaven. I saw the place of heaven. I saw the promise of heaven with my eyes. I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. I labored because of what I saw. Then he now still told us of the certificate he gained in his labor. Paul gained an unequaled, unequaled certificate in the Christian ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 33. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 33. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above major. In prisons more frequent, in days oft of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rocks, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers in perils by my own countrymen in perils by the hidden in perils in the city in perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea in perils among false brethren in weariness and painfulness in watchings often in hunger and thirst in fastings often in cold and nakedness beside those things that are without but God, that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches who is weak and I am not weak who is offended and I burn not if I must need glory I will glory in the things which concern my infirmities the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who is blessed forevermore knoweth that I lie not in Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of the Damascus with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his own hands. I do all these things for heaven. I do all these things to enter heaven. If I were doing this thing because of anything in this world, I should have been of all men most miserable. It's because I saw heaven. The Lord took me to see it. I went to see it. I said, I will burn down this candle. Every wax in the bottle of this candle must burn up. 
I must burn up this flesh. Let it suffer the worst death. Let me die like Jesus. I want to do everything to go to heaven. I'm telling you people did everything. New Testament people did everything to, in, to ensure they entered into heaven. heaven the, the Christianity is put into the generation of those that are relaxed. A generation of those that are at ease. A generation of those that are ignorant. A generation of those that are heavy loving with the earth. A generation of those that the pleasures of this life has taken over them. The, 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 the Christianity has come to them. That's why they're not talking about heaven. They, so they will even say that they are called not to talk of heaven. They are called to talk about the earth. They are called to talk about riches. They are talk, called to talk about prosperity. That is because the devil has given them bribe. Satan is the thieves that come to a place and they throw boon to a dog so that the dog can be busy and allow them to boggle into that house. The devil has thrown some things in this life into the people believers that they are so preoccupied with it. The devil has put some little thing in their hands. The devil has put some little honor in their hands. The devil has lifted them up to the noble's position. But because he wanted to remove their lands from them. He wanted to remove heaven. My brother the devil wants to remove heaven. He wants to remove heaven from your focus. Therefore wake up. Heaven is the, re the reward of the righteous. Heaven is what you should live for. It's what righteous people live for. Paul lived for heaven. And look up. He said in the book of 2 Timothy. Chapter, chapter 4 verse 6 to verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Is chapter 4 verse 6 to verse 8. He said. That's what Paul was telling us. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at home. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. He said, I have finished. I finished. <laughs> I fought to make this heaven. I fought, and it was a good fight. It was a good fight. I fought it to finish. Not to the persecution. You ended persecution on the way and gave up. And went back to your vomit. Not Paul. I fought to the finish. Now I have got heaven. And Peter too. Peter said the Lord revealed to him. About his going to heaven. Yes. The Lord revealed to him. About his going to heaven. And Peter said. Brethren this matter of the Christian faith. Is not, it's not a play. It's not a folk tale. Is reality. Look at it as Peter tells us in Second Peter chapter one, verse twelve to twenty-one. Here Peter is saying, "Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth." Yeah, I think it might as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus Christ has shot me moreover I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we make known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of this much of his majesty for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and this 
this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount we have also a most sure word of prophecy where unto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's wonderful. Peter walked and walked and walked until Jesus said, Now, Peter, you are coming to heaven. What a privilege to know the day, to know the period you will die. What a privilege that God can communicate to you. The period you will die. Now, can you join the scripture with history? Peter said the Lord upon me that I shall die shortly and history said it was going to be the date of crucifixion. Who told you that you must, the righteous always die peaceful dates? They are too troublous date, turbulent date, hard date, date of various kinds. But the Lord said it is your time to go. When it was not the time of Peter, they took him to prison. They couldn't behead him. But it was time for James. They took him to prison. They beheaded him. There is time for everything. I said there is time for everything. If the Lord has communicated to you that time has come for this, hear it. It reminded me that I, I think in 19, 1994, when I was to leave the government service, to full time service, Christian service. I didn't know it was time. So I wanted the church posted me to a particular place to go and do pastoral work there. I, I met with, the, I met with uh, my officer then. I said, can you transfer me to this other place? Because I have work to do. Because I served as an accountant with the government. So when I told the accountant general, can you transfer me to this place? There's a, a sub-treasury there, transfer me there. Because I have pastoral work to do in that place. He said, no, if the Lord is calling you, resign. Uh -uh, I tried every way. The man refused. Then I said, okay, what I will do is I will transfer my service to school management board so that they can post me as a secondary school teacher to that particular place that I may do the work of the Lord. So while I was planning this, the Lord says, when the time to leave the civil service has come, don't look for another work. That time had come. When the Lord reveals to you, that this is it. Where are you rejecting? Peter, where are you running to? Do you have any better way to end your life than the way the Lord prescribed? So, that's it. And Peter said, brethren, we're not, we're not telling you stories. This heaven is a reality. We're not telling you stories. God is a reality. We're not telling you stories. Jesus is a reality. We're not telling you stories. Eternal life is a reality. The dwelling place is a reality. The mansions, they're a reality. They're waiting for you. We're not telling you four tales. We're telling you real things. The scriptures are real. The prophecies of the scriptures. The promises of the scriptures. They are real. Believe them. Hold to them. And finally, praising saints should live for heaven. Praising saints. I know the Lord has to do work because the tree has sunk down root. I know the Lord has to do, to do work because the, 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 the place surrounding the tree is dry. I'm saying your heart has gone very far. I am saying the heart of the church has gone very far. No wonder. Actually, the Lord is doing work to recall heaven back to the hearts of believers. To bring heaven back to the hearts of believers. Can you stand up, my brother? It's people like this that he took to heaven and came back with the message of heaven. Why? He wanted to recover your heart.
The Lord wants to recover you. You can sit down. The Lord wants to recover you. So that you should know the earth is not a place. The place, the earth is not a home. This earth is not the reward of righteousness. That's why he's taking people to heaven and bringing them to narrate the beauty of heaven. To narrate the glory of heaven. If by any means he can persuade your heart again. So your heart can still start thinking about it. The soup has been in fridge for a long time. And now you want to use the soup. You are taking it back to the fire. And you are warming it. It is taking time. You are stirring it. Because as it boils around, the center of that food is soup is still cold. So you are still doing to send warmness, to pass heat to all part of the soup that it might be useful. That's what God is doing in your life. He's trying to take you round, take you round, that heaven will enter into every cell of your body. Heaven will enter into the hair of your head. Heaven will enter into every member of your body. Heaven should be now be flowing in your blood. Your blood should be heaven. Heaven. Your heart should be pumping heaven. Pumping heaven. 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 The Lord is doing everything because something has called you up. Something, something has congealed your mind. Brother, wake up. Heaven is the reward of the righteous and heaven is at hand. Sister, heaven is at hand. Where the sister? Can you raise up your hand? I want to tell you Yes, God wants to remind you about heaven. We know your sufferings. We know your pain. We know how some people ill treat you. God wants to say, you are a weaker vessel and you can easily give up. You can easily give up because of problem. Look at Job's wife that said to the husband, press God and die. That's why the Lord is saying, where are those sisters again? The Lord is reminding you. He has prepared a place for you. Amen. Where are the sisters outside? Are they, are they with us here? I'm not seeing your hands up. The Lord is telling you. He has prepared a place for you. Amen. The Lord is saying. He has prepared everlasting comfort. Amen. The Lord is saying. He is going to wipe away your tears. Amen. The Lord is saying. Whatever pains. Whatever disappointment of the womb. Whatever troubles of your body. Whatever that is. Is whatever, whatever the disappointment of life, married or not married, having children, not having children, the Lord is saying, Everlasting comfort, everlasting comfort, everlasting comfort, everlasting comfort is coming upon your life, is coming upon your soul. Where are the men? Yes, with the labors of this life. Yes, can you raise up your hand, all men? Where are you, all men? The God of rest. He said, There remain a rest. There remain a rest. All your labors, they're soon to come to an end. You are soon entering this heaven. The Lord has prepared a place for you. The Lord will give you everlasting rest. He will make you to rule, He will make you to triumph, He will bless your life. He will strengthen your life and joy shall be written on your faces. It shall be everlasting joy. <laughs> Hallelujah! The pleasures of this life, its fancies and comforts are covering the hearts of the believers from the rewards of heaven. The poverty, pains and hardships of this life are filling believers with sorrow and the sense of defeatism and misery. They seek heaven so distant away to be of any value to their present state. Hence, they struggle after material things of this life to serve as comforts for their present state. The Holy Spirit is revisiting the church with the vision of heaven. The ultimate reward of righteousness. The ultimate reward of the faithful believers. Return to God, my brother. Return to his word and promises. Value his promise. 
Value his promise. The promise of heaven. My father's house. Value it. His prepared city. Value that and live for heaven. And live for heaven. Henceforth, this is the exhortation of Jesus. He said, Lay your treasures upon lay not your treasures upon earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay your treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, and now neither thieves break through and steal. For where a man's treasure is, there his heart shall be also the lord is saying bring back heaven let your heart consider that your treasure is in heaven set heaven before you that your heart might leave this world to heaven let heaven fill your heart let the whole of your imagination be about heaven when you are going to see Jesus when you are going to see the heavenly father when you are going to see the throne let your heart go to heaven when you shall dwell in the presence of the Holy Ghost when you shall have fellowship with the angels when you shall reunite with the other sons let your heart go to heaven about the dentists of heaven pleasures of heaven the pledges of eternal life let that be there day the the power of this world cannot pull you the pledges of this life cannot pull you nothing because your heart is fixed in god and the bible says if you are risen with christ fix your heart set your affection on things above where Christ seated in the right hand of the Father. For ye are dead and your life is seated in Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, ye shall also appear with him in glory. So, brother and sister, let our hearts return to heaven. The Lord has sent me to tell you, your hearts should go back to heaven. The Lord is raising up preachers of heaven to cause the hearts of believers to go back to heaven. Then the persecutions of this life will mean nothing. The adversities of this life will mean nothing. The wants of this life will mean nothing. Then in sorrow you shall be joyful. In pain you shall be peaceful. Because you will remember heaven. You will remember heaven. The one day you are going to enter heaven endlessly pursue spiritual virtues that qualify for heaven add to your faith add to your faith virtues add to your faith knowledge add to your faith temperance add to your faith charity brotherly love yes add to your faith grow up in this righteousness then it shall, you will, the gate of heaven shall be open wide unto you the gate of heaven shall be open wide unto you. The gate of heaven shall be open wide unto you. I had a dream in some time, just not too long ago. I had a dream that I came up to heaven, to the gate of heaven, and I entered heaven without difficulty. I entered heaven with ease. I was there. I said, Hey, you mean I've come to heaven? Hey, so this thing we were doing is true. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I said, so I've entered heaven. This is wonderful. We have not yet been conducted to where God was. It was as if we were in a particular place. Then from there, we will not be conducted to the presence of God. I was just saying, eh? so you mean eternal life? So, eh? okay. All right. I, I will be living forever. Praise the Lord. That's how it will be. You will enter heaven with ease. If you do these things. If you practice this righteousness. If you practice this thing that I taught you. On holiness. On righteousness. Clean up yourself woman. All these dirty racks you are putting upon your body. All this dirty thing you are hanging in your ears. Hanging on your necks. All these things you are fixing in your, in your hands. And call it rings or wedding rings. All those things. If you can purge yourself from those things. You will enter heaven with ease. The door of heaven shall be open for you. One glorious morning.
we shall see our Savior. One glorious morning, we shall see our Lord. Rise up upon your feet. I'm telling you one glorious morning, we shall see our Savior. One glorious morning, we shall enter into this heaven with ease as we practice this word of truth. As we do this word of truth, you will just enter and the gates of heaven they shall be opened wide unto you. They shall be open wide unto you. Hey, glory to God. Brother, think about heaven. Sister, think about heaven. Think about heaven. One glorious morning, I shall see my Savior. One glorious morning, by and by. One glorious morning, I shall see my Redeemer. One glorious morning, by and by. One glorious morning, I shall see my Savior. One glorious morning, by by and by, by and by, one glorious morning, we shall see a Savior. One glorious morning, by and by and by. It shall be the song. Oh yes. Amen. When I get to heaven, I know I will see, I will see my loving Jesus and sing hallelujah amen when i get to heaven hallelujah the time is very short you will soon be there when i get to heaven i know whom i will see i will see my master jesus and sing hallelujah amen when i Sing hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wave your heart. Amen. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. People also wave your heart. When I get to heaven, I will see my Savior Jesus. I say, when I get to heaven,
and appreciate God for the privilege to know him. Let us thank God for the opportunity to come before him and worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Let us thank God for this rare privilege. Many others don't know Jesus. Our fellow human beings, our brothers in humanity, our wallowing in ignorance, they do not know Jesus. Let us thank God for this privilege, for it is a great opportunity indeed to know God. Let us thank Him. Let us appreciate Him for the privilege to come before Him in His sanctuary. Let us thank God for granting us the privilege to be alive, to worship Him in the beauty of His holiness. What a beautiful day. What a great day. What a great opportunity for reunion with our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we worship you. We give you praise, Lord. We adore your name. We exalt your name, Father. We magnify your name. We thank you, Father, for this privilege. We thank you for the opportunity to come before you. Father, we pray even for our brethren outside there who have not shared this privilege to know you. We ask, O oh God, to reach them. Reach out to them. Use us even as an outreach to those who do not know you. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We ask, O oh God, please wash us clean. Grant us the grace to live a life of righteousness and holiness. Grant us the grace, Father, to come before you clean. That even having confessed our sins, we ask, O oh God, visit us that we will not look back. Grant us the strength to overcome those areas we have conquered. That, Lord, we may not return there again. That which we have vomited, let us not swallow them again. Thank you, Holy Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you even for your servant, Ezekiel, that you are using to make us think heaven. And we will know that, Father, here is a strange land. The world is no home. Thank you, Father, for even the memory of the Patriots that have lived with heaven in view. Thank you for the Patriots that have lived also remembering that here is a strange land. We thank you also, Father, for your saints that lived in the New Testament. Thank you for your apostles that have also lived a life of righteousness. And that, Lord, you've taken them to reunite with you. Thank you for the saints you are developing these days. Thank you, Father, for putting the memory of heaven into us. We ask, O God, let the memory of heaven continue to rekindle on us, that we may live a life of righteousness and holiness. Thank you for the knowledge of good. Thank you for identifying with you. Thank you, Father, for knowing that there is price in righteousness. That even as we live, we may remember, Father, that yes, Mortars are in the church. Martyrs are in the church. That martyrs are not outside there. Those who do not know you claim they are living the life of martyrdom. No. The history of martyrdom is in the church. When you die for Christ, you reappear in his presence. Thank you, Father, for this knowledge. Thank you, Father, for your grace that, Lord, we have found you. We ask, O oh God, let the Spirit... Let the Holy Spirit continue to dwell in us. Let the Holy Spirit find our heart a worthy place to dwell in. That Lord, when the Holy Spirit takes a flight, we shall fly together with him. We shall not live to see tribulation in the name of Jesus. Even as we approach, Lord, your second coming, grant us the grace to be very conscious of this perilous time we are in. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We ask, O oh God, even as we fellowship together, your blessings shall be with us. We shall not leave this place the same as we came in. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. You came from heaven. You died for my sins. You purchased me. With your blood, you are my Lord and my Savior. You left your throne above and took up the form of a servant for my sins.
Oh uh-huh. 